Should humans be considered an invasive species? That's what we'll be discussing in this module. This information comes from chapter 19 of our textbook. Now, the goal for this module is for learners to recognize the components of ecosystems, to define what it means for a species to be endangered, and to list the threats which humans impose on other species. So there will be three lecture videos for this module, where we'll describe ecosystems and the roles within the ecosystems. We'll talk about the concepts of species being endangered, of going extinct, and lastly, talking about humans being an invasive species and whether that definition fits or not. Ecology. is the study of the interaction among organisms and between organisms and their environment. This can mean organisms of the same species, so multiple individuals in a single population, and also interactions between different species, such as predator-prey interactions or predator and food source. So ecology looks at interactions within a population and between populations of different species in a given area. Populations include all the individuals of a species in a single area. Both evolution and adaptation and reproduction are the two characteristics of life that need to be true for a population, but not necessarily for individuals. A community is going to be all of the species of, a, of living organisms in a specific area. One of the goals of an ecologist is to estimate the size of populations. How can this happen? Well, there are a few different ways. The most basic is called a census, where every individual is counted. This can happen with something like humans, where a population is counted and each individual is represented. This can be due with certain types of organisms that don't move around very much, like trees or plants in a given area. But when you're dealing with mobile organisms, it's hard to ensure that you've counted every individual. So another technique that ecologists have used is known as the mark and recapture method, where a scientist will set out some sort of trap or a way to catch individuals in the population um, in a way that they aren't harmed, they aren't damaged, but they're collected, then they're marked in some way. They're either tagged or a little spot of paint is put on them, or, or somehow the researcher knows that that individual had been caught previously. Those marked individuals are released back into the wild back into the population. And then that trapping technique is used again sometime later. And the researcher notes how many of those individuals who were trapped a second time had been marked and caught the first time. Through some relationships there, they can determine what the relative size of the population is that they're dealing with. Now, when looking at a population within their ecosystem, the individuals of that population, they may be randomly distributed, they may be clumped together, or they may be uniformly distributed. So how populations are distributed in their environment will also tell us about the ecosystem and resource availability. Random distribution usually means that the offspring are distributed through some chaotic means, such as a wind distribution or something like that. Clump distribution usually means that there are localized resources essential for survival. And a uniform distribution is actually a biological indication that the species are interacting with each other. For instance, with these penguins, they're uniformly distributed, each about one pecking distance away from their neighboring penguin during nesting season. So they are territorial and make sure the others don't get too close while they're sitting on their eggs. 
Population demographics is another aspect that ecologists are interested in. So some of the important information for a population is the makeup of age, reproductive status, and biological sex. This information will allow ecologists to make predictions about how the population will change in size in the immediate future. So figuring out how populations change is one of the goals of an ecologist. Short-term population change and long-term population change are both important to the study of ecology. The relationship between the birth rate and death rate of a population will predict whether that population is growing, declining, or staying the same. The makeup of the proportion of individuals in the reproductive population can also be somewhat indicative of the upcoming generations, if the upcoming generations will be larger or smaller, in turn determining the growth of that population. So here we're specifically looking at a human population with the reproductive years highlighted and if we see a population where most of the reproducing individuals are very young in age, that tells us we're in a rapidly growing population. If there's a linear trend from young to old in the reproductive age, that's an indication of slow growth. If instead of being linear, it's more of a parabolic relationship with most of the individuals who are reproducing, each age group having about the same number of members, that's a sign of a stable population. It's not really changing. It won't likely be growing. The next generations will likely be the size of the previous generations. However, if you have a population where the older generations are actually higher in number than the younger generations, that's actually a sign of a decreasing population, a population size that is getting smaller. Intuitively, we expect that if the birth rate is higher than the death rate, this will cause a population to grow. And a death rate higher than the birth rate will cause the population to shrink. So it's interesting to notice that the percentage of the population in different reproductive stages of life also plays an important role. Now, when we look at an ecosystem, we are specifically looking at how species interact with each other. For these species interactions, we had discussed earlier that autotrophs, or self-feeders, these are going to be the primary producers. These are going to be the organisms that photosynthesize. They are the foundation of a food web or ecosystem because they are supplying the biological energy it's these organisms that convert solar energy into chemical energy. And then there are the heterotrophs. These are the other feeders, the consumers. They need to consume organic material in order to get their energy. So you have the organisms that directly feed on the primary producers. These are the primary consumers whether they're small insects, whether they're large herbivores, their food source is primarily coming from the plants. And then we have the carnivores. These are the organisms that eat other animals. And in this way, even though they're not feeding directly on plants, they're getting their energy from that photosynthesis because the animals they're eating had been feeding on plants. And so looking at roles in an ecosystem, we have our predators, which are organisms that consume other living organisms. We have our prey, which are organisms that are killed and consumed by other organisms. And then lastly, we also have our decomposers. Even an apex predator that doesn't have any organisms directly preying upon it 
When it dies, it will be decomposed and broken down, and the nutrients returned to the ecosystem. If an animal is in danger of going extinct, what would cause that to happen? That's what we'll talk about in our next video.